Hello everyone and welcome to another One Piece chapter review. This, this chapter is actually, it, it's good. It's a good chapter. Uh, much better, much better than the one we got previously because not only does this chapter not have any inconsistencies, but it also gives us more depth to other aspects that, that were previously in the series. And I'll talk about them a little bit later, but I mean, I was just so excited. We start off with a fan request of Jimbei getting a haircut by a spider crab. Japanese spider crab. They look like this. And I'm actually kind of curious if the sort of mafia like slash gangster look that the crab has going on is a reference to Capone. Because just like Jimbei, the last time we saw Capone was when they were in Whole Cake Island and they were trying to escape. So I don't know if that's like a hint hint that they're both together at this point. We get Hiyori's reaction in the first page to Zoro confirming that Momonosuke is in fact alive and well. But I think uh, to me the most interesting part of the first page is when uh, she's listing like the samurai friends or the, the allies and she mentions somebody by the name of Kikunojo. I'm assuming Kikunojo is Okiku's full name and I think, I'm pretty sure in fact, that this is the first time we've ever heard it, like her full name. Uh, so I tried to, you know, look up stuff like to see if it meant something because we know that there's been something about her that we don't really exactly know, like she's hiding something about her identity. And so I found it very interesting that the word Ojo means king's daughter in Japanese. Hiyori then goes on to talk about the night of the time jump where the palace was on fire and we already had gotten confirmation that Odin was in fact dead. Uh, but what she gives us here is the fact that uh, Toki, Lady Toki is also pretty much like she, she died that night as well. And so because Lady Toki had the powers of the time time fruit and she passed away, we can pretty much guarantee that that fruit uh, grew again someplace and, and maybe somebody else has it. It could even be Hiyori, the one who inherited those same powers that her mother had, and maybe she has the ability to, you know, jump into the future now, or, you know, jump in time. Now, back in Act 1, we actually got a shot of that same night where the palace was burning, and in it, there was an individual that we didn't know who it was. But now, thanks to this chapter, we can pretty much confirm that that mysterious figure with, with that hat was actually Kawamatsu, the kappa. Now, if you've been following me, you know that we figured out that this guy was a kappa back in chapter 936, where Oda decided to include this guy's laugh, and it was like, kappa, pa, pa. So I, I read you a description of what a kappa is. But what I think is funny is that he's wearing that hat, I think specifically to hide his head, because kappas like, on their head have like this little, this little bowl of water. <laughs> so I feel like that's why he has that, just to sort of hide his head from people. Uh, but also another very important thing is that we see him swim in the flashback. So if he's swimming in the flashback, at the very least, that means that he was not a Devil Fruit user at that point in time. However, what I find very interesting is that when he's talking to Raizo, he specifically mentions that when he's in the prison, when he's in the cell, he says that he has handcuffs on. So why would you put sea stone handcuffs on somebody that doesn't have a devil fruit power. It just makes no sense. So there's a couple of options here, a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is maybe Kawamatsu got a devil fruit power after this scene. He already said that like they got separated when she was 13, so maybe he ate a devil fruit after that or, or during that time. Um, another thing could be like, what if he has a devil fruit power that is like a mythical type Zoan, uh, you know, one of, the, one of those legendary Zoans, uh, and that allows, like somehow that, that's one of the like only fruits in the verse that breaks the rule that allows that user to be able to swim because of the nature of the devil fruit. I don't know. I think that's, that's, that's a little bit of a reach. And then the last option is that if Kawamatsu is in fact an actual kappa, like an actual, you know, Japanese water demon of sorts, then we pretty much just got introduced to a new species in the world of One Piece. Or maybe a kappa is just part of the fishman race. Anyway, because of the reveal that Kawamatsu is in fact the samurai that wears that, that hat, uh, this leaves us with Denjiro being the samurai that has the ponytail. When, when Kinemon was describing them, we saw three silhouettes. We have the one for Ashura Doji confirmed now. We know what, what Ashura Doji looks like. Now we have one for Kawamatsu because he's wearing the hat. And the final one is the guy with the ponytail, and that is Denjiro. I really enjoyed Hiyori's facial expression and reaction to Nekomamushi and Inorashi being alive. <laughs> it reminded me of the, this, this Luffy face. But by far the best part of this entire scene is when Zoro is thinking to himself, he's complaining, how am I ever going to go to sleep with these two people like just yakking, like they're so loud. The next panel, both him and Toko have a snot bubble coming out of their nose. It's, this is what we call great comedic timing. 
Now, before we leave Ringo, Hiori mentions that she's going to go ahead and wait until after the final battle has taken place so that she can reunite with her family, which is very, very similar to the same sentiment that we've seen uh, Kinemon share when he was about to go up to uh, Otsuru and he said, no, uh, we'll, we'll reunite once this whole thing is taken care of after the final battle. So it seems like Oda has been planting seeds that the family reunion or like these relationships are only going to come back together after the fight against Kaido. We head over to the flower capital, the Rosetsu district, and it says there on the notes that uh, Rosetsu is actually Japanese for Rakshasa. And Rakshasa is actually a, a demon, but the translation of Rakshasa is man-eater, which is, is, it kind of makes sense given the fact that they're in prison and it would, it would make, it would give the impression that these men are inside like, you know, some kind of mouth of sorts. And some of these guys, we've actually seen them walking around Wana before. This is not the first time we've seen them. Uh, unfortunately, Beppo, Shachi, and Penguin have also been caught, and we knew that from Sanji, and they're worried that they're gonna be getting the blame over leaking the plans, and of course, a little bit of this has already happened, we've already seen it, where uh, Shinobu's first instinct was to blame Beppo after finding out that they had been captured, and of course, Law defended his crew. Of course, we as the audience know that it wasn't Beppo, Shachi, or Penguin who leaked the plans, but then that still leaves us with the question, if it wasn't them, then who was it? And why would they do that? Then we shift to Udon, and I like how Kawamatsu is just sitting in his cell, and we get to see like the, the brim of his hat, and he's like, I want to wrestle too. He's kind of like, you know, he's, he's kind of urging for a fight, um, and I can't wait to see his design and actually like see him in action. But in this case, Luffy and Grandpa Hio are up against Alpaca Man and Armadillo Man. And the Queen is just, you know, just, just enjoying his Oshiruko. Can't wait to see Big Mom find out that he ate it all. And uh, Luffy, begins to use Future Sight. And, and he does it very matter-of-factly, like this is something that I can do now, not that big of a deal. He's just describing what will happen to Grandpa Hio. Now, if you've been following my videos, you know that Luffy has been able to use Future Sight casually like this since chapter 911. That was the first chapter where I noticed Luffy's ability to use Future Sight casually. Uh, at one point during that chapter, there are two snipers that are aiming at him with a scope, and these snipers are riding two lizards, and so they're aiming at Luffy, and the way that Luffy uh, protects himself from the shots requires Future Sight, because it requires him to be able to move and make a decision before uh, they pull the trigger. It was very similar to the Flampe situation where Luffy actually got hit with the dart. Um, so this was Oda's way of saying that if that were to happen again, like he would be able to counter like those long range attacks because he can actually see these attacks and where they're gonna come from before they actually happen in reality, in real time. At one point, it's really cool because he's giving Grandpa Hio a thumbs up and, and you can tell that he's, you know, he's applying Future Sight because he's giving a, a thumbs up through two bullet shots that are literally like passing, one's over his arm, the other one is under. And he's like, there you go, Grandpa Hio, but they're like, Phew. it's just a very, very cool showcase of future side observation hockey. So Whole Cake Island was about Luffy developing that, that next level observation hockey. Wano is about him developing that next level armament hockey. I've been re-watching some of the episodes where this new armament hockey type slash level gets introduced. And uh, at one point, like there's a scene where Sentomaru counters a Gatling without even moving. He just sends him flying back with, with his invisible armament hockey. And then he also has a line where he says he has the strongest defense in the world, uh, which I don't know how true that is. I don't know if he's like overhyping himself or like, you know, just tooting his own horn. But we do know for a fact that he has to be strong, not only because of the advanced level of armament hockey that he has, but also because he's Vegapunk's bodyguard. I mean, that position should speak for itself. You don't, you don't just put anybody to guard one of the like most highly renowned uh, scientific minds in the world. So, you know, th there's a reason to why Sentomaru was entrusted with that job, and it could be that he's just that strong. How, how strong he is, I don't know. We don't know yet. What I think is interesting, though, is that when Rayleigh introduces the concept, he describes it to Luffy as wearing an invisible armor. Note that he says invisible. So I'm kind of curious, like, how much weight are we actually going to give that word, invisible? Because, I mean, I, so far, like, it was invisible pre-time skip, but but not post, not post-time skip. I mean, I think we've been able to see hockey very, very clearly. And even like Yogoro in this chapter, we see that when he lands that thrust, his palm is darkened. 
Uh, however, as we see him charge, not only is his palm like darkened, it almost seems like he has a tattoo, kind of like in Luffy Gear Fourth. But there's an aura surrounding his palm as well, and that's something that we we haven't seen, uh, you know, armament hockey like manifest itself as. So I was thinking that perhaps the aura that we see surrounding Hyogoro's palm in this chapter, uh, maybe that could explain why back in the day his head or his hair was on fire, that it's actually like, like, like the same hockey energy or aura. Because I think like where this is headed is that once you're able to master the darkened armament hockey, then you can move beyond and go to that same or achieve that same type that Sentomaru uh, and, and Hyogoro and Rayleigh have that allows allows that suit of armor to sort of come off and be blasted away from your body. And the reason I say that is because there's a scene in Dress Rosa where Luffy's about to, uh, you know, uh, defeat Doflamingo, and he has a flashback to Rayleigh, and Rayleigh says, "You know, I'm not really sure about that Gear Fourth of yours because it taxes it taxes your body way too much." So if if you think about it, like Rayleigh in this scene is complaining about that dark armament hockey that Luffy is using for his gear fourth. And he tells him, you better you better come up with something else. And then Luffy just kind of like laughs and he's like, okay. And, and he says like, that's where he just kind of came up with uh, King Kong gun. But if you look at that scene, like Rayleigh also complains and says, well, that that's even worse. Because it's like, you know, that's that's even more hockey that you're using up. So I think what Rayleigh was going for, and I think like Luffy said in one of the previous chapters, like Rayleigh's movements were very, very light compared to my own. So I think what Rayleigh was going for is like you need to be able to master this 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 other type of armament hockey that doesn't tax your body as much. And even in this chapter, we have Luffy literally complain about that same type of armament hockey. When, when he's about to hit Armadillo Man, he's like, nope, this is this is just regular hockey. I need something more. So we got two options here. Either this new level of armament hockey is going to allow Luffy to completely bypass or uh, significantly reduce or just completely eliminate the time restraint, the time limit that he has uh, for his gear fourth, or it's going to allow him to do some serious damage to his opponents uh, without having to go gear fourth in the first place. Now, here's the thing. I don't know if this is where Oda is going with this, but imagine if you could actually combine these both of these types of hockey into one attack. Imagine a King Kong gun, all right? And remember, this is this is what a King Kong gun did to Dress Rosa. Like it literally split downtown in half, right? Imagine a fully loaded next level armament hockey energy blast coming on top of a King Kong gun from Luffy. That would be B-R-O, Kaioken, Broken. I mean, holy smoke. No wonder he says that if he masters this, he might be able to crack through Kaido scales. Again, black armament hockey coupled with this new energy blasting hockey. What would that even look like? Now, after Luffy says this comes a scene with, with Hyogoro that just blew my mind. I mean, it blew me away. It, it, it sent me flying through dimensions and stuff because holy mo like, let me explain. Hyogoro says this, Hyogoro says Straw Hat. Here in Wano, we actually also have an ability like that. Meaning we also have, we also have hockey here. We historically here in the land of Wano have been historically able to transfer that power from the user's body towards the sword. And he says, then we can use that to either cut the toughest steel or not be able to cut the thinnest paper. So you can cut anything or nothing depending on what you want. This is a quote, this is a direct ref, oh, actually, before I get there, rewatch, rewatch the fight between Zoro and Mr. One. I guarantee, or at least watch the ending of that fight, I guarantee you will not be able to watch that scene the same way again after this chapter. At one point, Mr. One pretty much dices and slices Zoro up. And then Zoro gets back up and he's like, Mr. One turns around and he's like, wait, how did he dodge all these, all these stones? Like all this rubble that I cut was about to fall on him. How did he dodge? And then Zoro says, I could tell the place where no stones would be falling. And he describes it as being able to sense the rhythm of his environment, all right? 
Now, granted, like, you know, in this scene, Zaro's like, you know, you know, he's, he's pretty wounded. He's like almost on the brink of death. So, and we know from Rayleigh that hockey blooms in intense situations. But tell me, tell me this is not a reference to observation hockey. And he says, like, I could sense the, the stones falling, right? But, but that's not even the most important part. The most important part is that during that fight, before he lands the Shisunson, he has a flashback to his master, Master Koshiro. And he remembers Koshiro telling him, listen, there are swordsmen in this world that can cut nothing, which gives us a direct link with what Hyogoro just said. You can use it to cut the toughest steel. And remember, this is how Zoro learns to cut steel in Alabasta. But then he says, and you can use it to not be able to cut the thinnest paper. You can cut anything and nothing. What I'm saying is that just like how we got our first glimpse at King's Hockey, all right, with Shanks in the beginning of the series, this, this scene in Alabasta, I consider it to be the first glimpse, the first theoretical glimpse into both armament hockey and observation hockey in the series. If, if you find any other moments before this moment, let me know. Also, because of the complete resemblance of what Koshiro said back in that chapter, back in the flashback to Zoro, and because of what uh, Hyogoro said in this chapter, pretty much confirms Zoro's master is in fact from Wano. It's confirmed in this chapter, no doubt about it. Um, it also explains why uh, Momonosuke, remember like Zoro had taught him like this, this word and Kiku said, oh no, don't use that word. Like this, this was a word that was, you know, sort of uh, taboo back in the day in Wano. It explains how Zoro learned that word to begin with. Also in one of the most recent SBSs, a fan asked Oda about Minatomo, uh, you know, Minatomo, like the carpenter. So he was asking about how did this guy get from the East Blue all the way into Wano, because Wano has closed borders and stuff. And Oda said that uh, they're not the same person, but they're, uh, they're, they're family members, like they're, they're connected through family. So they're from the same family. And he said that the way that the Minotomo that we saw in the East Blue that fixed the door uh, from, from the bar where Luffy and Shanks were at, he said that the way that he got all the way over there was because there was a ship that was able to sail away from Wano a long time ago, a, a, a ship set sail away from Wano and ended up in the East Blue. And he said that it wasn't just uh, Minatomo's family member, but also there was another character that made it out of Wano, but that he didn't want to talk about it too much because it could potentially be a spoiler. So I think that pretty much confirms that theory. And then finally, I noticed a similarity in this new level of armament hockey with the like the advanced level of observation, which is future sight. I noticed a connection between this, this type of, of armament hockey and future sight. And that's the fact that, remember how Luffy was able to land uh, his first hit against Katakuri? It was because Katakuri lost his focus. He lost his cool, he didn't stay calm, and that's how Luffy got the upper hand. Now, if you look at what Luffy said in one of the previous chapters, he says, like, I remember Rayleigh's movements being lighter than this. So, uh, and then also, again, if you look at, like, the thing that, like, the scene in context, the, the Alabasta scene in context with uh, that flashback of Koshiro and how Zoro is also very calm and he's, like, you know, sensing his environment. He's like, oh, like, again, the, the theoretical beginnings of hockey, right? The similarity that I noticed is that I think in order to be able to use both the next level version of observation and the next level version of armament, you have to be at peace to some extent. You have to be calm. There is some level of tranquility that those types of hockey require. This is more like just kind of letting things flow and then focusing your energy and releasing it, but releasing it in a, in a smoother fashion. You know how in Avatar The Last Airbender, each element had its own unique fighting style and movements associated to it, uh, to, to be able to bend it? That's what this reminds me of. Like this is, this is a different hockey that requires a different type of mindset and movement. That's it for me. Thought the chapter was a good one. Let me know what you thought about it down below in the comments section. Like the video if you did, I really appreciate that. Subscribe to my channel. If you haven't done so already, the final season of Game of Thrones starts this Sunday. I'll catch you guys there. Take care. Bye.